Kermut is, as we've just agreed, an old friend of the house. She's been here before, we know her well, we've worked with her well, both on Brexit and on a range of other issues. And we've also visited her in her own establishment. She started her career at the Centre for Applied Policy Research in Munich, and then worked as an independent politi policy political analyst in London, at that stage on EU Middle East relations. She then led the German pro European programme at the German Council on Foreign Relations, and is now with the European Council on Foreign Relations, and jointly heads the Berlin office. She's also the non-resident fellow at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins at Washington. So with a CV like that, you will know that we have a great deal to look forward to. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. It is a great pleasure to be back here. I was really very happy to be invited. Um, it is always very good to be here, and uh, especially uh, in my new role at the European Council on Foreign Relations, of course, um, we are trying to bring European voices into, into Berlin, into Germany. There is a great deal of work that uh, we are also doing in trying to explain Germany um, to those who are interested in the outside world, uh, in particular in Europe. But um, I think it's more important and even more challenging at times um, to bring the diversity of European views to Germany. As a big country, as you know, we are a large uh, group of German speakers and you, know, you, you have a lot to talk about as, as a German. And uh, I think in the um, support of a European reality going beyond a German reality, um, this is also, I believe, very important. Um, times are by no means easy. I was about... Um, and to say earlier on when we had a sort of quick um, uh, uh, gathering that uh, for Germans it's been particularly difficult to see two pillars of their foreign policy uh, starting to crumble, that is the European uh, Union with uh, the Brexit vote and uh, first sign of strong sign of disintegration of the Union on the one hand and uh, the uncertainty about the future trajectory of the United States engagement uh, with regard uh, to Europe in particular. Um, but then I noticed that there are some countries, probably including your own, uh, where this must feel even more uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, development. Um, I thought, Catherine, um, to really keep it relatively short, because we want to have a conversation, sure, if, this is, uh, mm -hmm. if this is uh, acceptable. Um, and uh, I want uh, to really focus on a major shift that I see in the German-European debate. Um, which came really to me in the course of the summer where I very often go and travel to various British-German conferences. Um, there is this business uh, that you might be aware of, of uh, Königswinter and the British-German Forum and the like, and I've been really engaging uh, in these over the past years, and of course this year it has been particularly interesting um, because uh, this was really right after the Brexit vote. And... Um, it's it was really striking for me to see that already months before that, the German conversation um, had been a lot less about the European Union itself. Uh, as you know, you can always interest Germans uh, for institutional and constitutional debates. There is a big contingency also amongst uh, uh, policy analysts, amongst uh, lawyers, constitutional lawyers. Um, you can cater to a big audience if, if you're doing that. Um, but this is really not what the major European debate is about in, in Germany at this point in time. It hasn't been for quite a few months, if not years. Uh, and interestingly, this, of course, is a stark contrast to the debate in the United Kingdom, where the Europe debate and the EU reform debate has been sort of really in a more narrow way, um, being about institutions. Um, and this is really ironically where Germany and the UK are really uh, miles apart um, at the moment. Um, of course, Germany cares about institutions and the cohesiveness of the Union, uh, no doubt about that. Germany is very strongly pushing back uh, and continues to on uh, any um, attempt to undermine the um, for freedoms in the, in the single market arrangement, etc. But Germany, I think, is interested in conversations um, that are not necessarily EU-European conversations, but questions of European prosperity and security at large. Through the lens of Berlin policymakers, um, there has been a particular, um, I think, shock, um, uh, or two senses, uh, two shocks in, in, in a certain way. The first shock uh, was the one um, about the euro um, that revealed that this currency union is not sustainable. 
and the attempts that you know very well and the difficulties um, to go through this period of uncertainty um, of trying to craft a better uh, Eurozone governance, uh, which is unfinished business, as everybody knows. But the big promise of, sp of prosperity um, as part of the, the European Union dream has been challenged, and this has come as a shock to those in Germany that have been and continue to want to build uh, uh, the Union and the Eurozone. And the second one, and I think that is probably even more formative because it's more existential, is um, a different risk assessment now uh, about the European environment, the neighborhood um, that we are all living in. Um, and that really started with the Russian annexation of Crimea. Um, we know that Germany has been one of the countries and continues to be with um, strong ties and business interests uh, uh, in Russia, if you look at the engagement of, uh, of its, um, uh, of its uh, companies. But um, the debate over the past years since the annexation of Crimea has been driven by the political um, uh, argument and not by the business argument. And there has been, uh, in my experience, a real shift and a real sense that um, Moscow is trying to undermine what, uh, as far as the Germans are concerned, has been um, a stable security order on the European continent. And it feels very close to home for Germans uh, and for German policymakers in Berlin. Um, that suddenly borders are started to be moved around on the European continent. And this has been a real wake-up call. Um, and uh, probably what brought in the German public more uh, into this discussion is the refugee crisis, the refugee management crisis, you might call it, um, where we can discuss also the role that Germany played uh, itself in, in this, and it has been a controversial one, uh, as, as we all know. But um, the impact is it has had at large on the German public is a realization that the world around us is one that matters at home. Because people arriving on literally on people's doorsteps, uh, um, fleeing the, the war, looking for a brighter economic uh, future as well, is something that has been going to every corner of Germany. Um, where um, refugees and, and migrants have started to arrive. And the idea that um, we can close off um, is certainly very tempting, but it's uh, something that, of course, you cannot really promise um, looking at the geography of Europe. And um, the German government, the chancellor in particular, has been trying to navigate that. Um, she's been trying to make the case for Germany still needing to keep open um, against even a powerful discourse that talks about renationalization in many parts of Europe um, that comes up with um, a framing that is about national interest first, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, she knows that Germany is heavily dependent on a European and an international environment that is, keeps its openness in terms of, of trade, in terms of its, its own mindset uh, to the world, and she's been really fighting hard uh, to, to preserve that. Uh, having said that, and this brings me back to the sort of argument about the second shock, the security shock on Germany um, or on Europe at large, and one where Germany is playing an increasing role. Um, the debate about Germany stepping up its um, commitment in European security and defense had already started even before the annexation of Crimea. Um, if we remember the Munich Security Conference in 2014 with the speeches by President Gauck and Ministers von der Leyen and also um, uh, Minister Steinmeier, who was about to be elected, I believe, as the next German president in, in February next year, um, the debate was starting to, to roll and then the annexation of Crimea happened and then the refugee crisis happened uh, and uh, now we have uh, an unpredictability about the future commitment of uh, Donald Trump's administration when it comes to European security. So within really a sh very, very short period of time, um, probably by the time Trump takes office, three years time, embracing of the German political elite of a different security discourse and the changing environment um, not to forget, of course, um, very important, uh, the attacks, the terrorist attacks on European soil, on French uh, uh, soil, on, uh, in Belgium, um, not yet in, in uh, other countries, but not unlikely uh, to happen, including in my own, uh, God forbid. But uh, we should uh, not, um, I think, 
um, forget that this has also been very formative uh, for Germany. So in these three years, there has really been a tremendous change in the situation. And this is, and this is why, um, in my reading of the German um, political class, um, mostly in Berlin, which is where I'm, where I'm based, of course, um, is looking at this through an instrumental lens rather than through an ideological lens. Um, brings me back to my first point to say that, yes, there is a European debate uh, in Germany. It's not an institutional debate. It's one that says, with all these threats to European prosperity and security, and with the ambition to still shape an environment that is more conducive to German and European interests, and not less, <laughs> um, what are our instruments? Um, and of course, there is always a very strong reflex in Germany to look at the European Union. This is where a lot of resources are still being invested. And um, there is at the same time also um, a very, I'd say, sober assessment of other instruments, ways, means, coalitions that Germany has, um, in particular with its European partners, um, to um, work towards a better outcome uh, of the challenges to prosperity and security. And that includes NATO. There is a serious debate about the role of NATO um, in Germany's uh, engagement. Nowhere near the 2% uh, that in many corners of Europe and in the US any German speaker will always be confronting, uh, maybe less so here. I understand uh, this country is also having a different approach to its uh, foreign and security policy engagement. But um, there is also a question of um, what other fora do we have? The United Nations, how can we play a role? The G20 in which Germany is about to take um, uh, the presidency on the 1st of December, the OSCE outgoing presidency of this year. Um, so a real assessment of where, where is our leverage individually and collectively. And um, this brings the German political elite always back, of course, to the European environment, the EU environment in particular. Um, the British question then against the background of discussing security is one that is a big challenge, also from the point of view of Berlin. Um, when we don't know yet where the UK is headed and how much can you build in a spirit of trust in areas of internal and external security while uh, the United Kingdom is negotiating a new settlement with the European Union, being aware that this is particularly pressing also for Ireland uh, as a country. Um, but these, this, this is the real debate in, in Berlin at this point in time, and this is miles away from what we've had throughout the 90s and in the early 2000s when Europe was mostly discussing um, institutional reform, um, you know, the big treaties that maybe some were involved even in negotiating. Um, so th there is now also an understanding that, um, uh, and that is worrisome for the political elite in Germany, that at this point in time, when the challenges are probably stronger than ever in the history of the European Union, the European Union looks weaker than ever. And that has to do with the centrifugal forces um, that many analysts have been describing and politicians have been discussing that Germany probably has also partly contributed to, um, to be discussed, uh, uh, if you wish. But um, where Germany has a strong sense of ownership to work against the centrifugal forces in the Union and to keep the Union together um, as a community of committed countries that are willing to sit around the table uh, debates not being easy and not leave the table and th until there is a joint consensus. And um, there is a question mark to what extent at the moment that can be d achieved um, amongst the EU 27 even. Um, there is still a thinking in terms of EU 28 in Berlin, but it's getting less as well as we, as we can see. Um, but there is also a realization, and the foreign minister talks about that more than Angela Merkel herself, that um, old debates about flexible integration, the flexible union, um, might be important ones to have now because the centrifugal forces are so strong um, that all the negative aspects that we know flexible integration can entail um, might still be outweighed by a positive outcome if a core group of member states started to really rebuild the trust amongst the citizens that the union or uh, countries of the Union working together can actually achieve something and, and work uh, together in a spirit of trust, uh, in a spirit of joint ownership, mm -hmm. and um, 
for me, it's quite interesting, uh, as you can see, I mean, my lifetime has not been endless uh, in discussing these things, but over the past 15 years that I looked at these questions, again, this is a completely different uh, environment where we have to discuss the trust amongst uh, European governments, uh, um, whether they can really achieve things together and they can trust each other and they can give each other the benefit of the doubt. Now, um, just briefly, and this would be my last point on coalitions, um, that Germany has been starting, um, I think, to, to explore a little bit more. Um, of course, the old argument about the Franco-German alliance that we've had for quite some time now, that even France and Germany can't pull the Union along, um, has gotten ever more difficult uh, with um, a, a president in France uh, with relatively limited room for maneuver at this, at this stage. And um, Berlin trying to um, support, I think, in my reading, um, France succeeding in, in, in overcoming some of the um, questions about its own, its own prowess and strengths. I think the Franco-German cooperation in foreign and security um, policy has been a very strong case in point. Um, the uh, Normandy format and the role France and Germany played in uh, dealing with the situation in Ukraine, um, but also the more recent um, defense um, uh, joint uh, announcements between the two ministries of defense. So there is a serious commitment, of course, to continue working with France, um, but there needs to be more um, um, to kind of gain traction within a very diverse union where we've seen coalitions emerge um, that have started to position themselves um, in opposition to Germany as well, in particular on the refugee crisis. Um, there's a lot of talk in, in continental Europe, uh, in, at least in my part of, of Europe, about the Visegrad Four and to what extent this is a coherent uh, group or not. I think Germany does not have a problem per se in, in seeing coalitions being built that don't even include Germany, but I think Germany is concerned about for the German government about coalitions that want to shape common ground rather than block and sort of not take the union forward to some goal of ever closer union, but to take European countries together to a place of policies uh, that can be owned jointly and that improve in terms of deliverables um, the life of citizens of, of our countries. Um, so, um, and that for Germany has been particularly difficult to see that um, um, Poland, uh, relations with Warsaw, that have been very strong, very strong, even sometimes underestimated by other parts, I think, by other capitals in, in Europe, um, mm. have gotten, of course, more difficult, more challenging over the past year um, with the peace government. Um, and also, um, not really, if you look at the table that Angela Merkel convened in, um, in Berlin last week, um, not really necessarily very predictable allies in, um, in Italy, where uh, Matteo Renzi is facing a very difficult referendum. Um, I'm being told by our colleagues in, in Rome that things are not looking particularly good for him in this. Um, François Hollande um, uh, will no longer be uh, president, and the question what happens in the French elections uh, next May. Um, of course, is, is looming. Theresa May, who was also around this table, is no longer part of this um, a club where I think the assumption is that there is an ownership um, for the wider European Union. And then um, where is Germany left? And here I think there is a real shortcoming, a real shortcoming of the German uh, Europa politik of the past years. And this argument has been made a lot, but I think it remains very valid. There is a lot of underexplored potential in my reading um, with a whole number of countries um, in the European Union that are not part of this big business uh, um, of big countries sitting around the tables. Um, but these are countries who share preferences with Germany, countries that um, will also have a common outlook on, on governance, and you know, countries that are like-minded, um, probably the Nordic countries, um, the Netherlands, um, Austria to some extent. M many of these countries have difficult Domestic conversations when it comes to the European Union, um, which I believe is less the case uh, uh, here in, in Ireland, but um, I think still, um, and we know that because we, are, uh, we made the effort to talk to a lot of uh, people representing these countries, there is a great deal of um, interest in Germany in trying to understand its policy machinery, um, its decision making, the movers and shakers. 
um, the preferences, um, really trying to, um, uh, to interest Berlin for their own interests. Um, and I think this has been, in many ways, not exploited enough. I think there is a lot of underexplored potential um, for coalitions that are not necessarily um, the core group that uh, Wolfgang Schäuble and Karl Lamas uh, probably had on their mind in, in the uh, mid-90s, and uh, so that were engaging in the constitutional uh, debate on flexible integration in the early 2000s, um, including Joschka Fischer and others, where they talked about uh, um, uh, countries taking the lead. We're not so much interested, and this is a policy brief that I drafted with a colleague of mine, uh, Josef Janning, who has also been here in the past, and we worked jointly with Catherine and others on this question of coalition building. So we try to bring this, um, take this argument further by saying um, that there is still room to build a new political center in the European Union that is not a, a static center that is um, uh, probably needing more of a continued engagement in the process of coalition building um, of countries who are willing in sectoral policies to really create common ground, sit around the table, develop traction for other countries um, in the European Union, and to move forward a joint agenda. Um, and this is uh, um, not static, like I say, the static understanding, but it's a place of constructed consensus uh, which is difficult, of course, to achieve. It needs uh, a diligent investment. It needs mutual understanding. Um, sometimes I feel over the past years, the German government perhaps did not have much time because it was doing a lot of jobs, but perhaps has also underestimated that German power does something to others, even though they might be interested in cooperating uh, with Berlin. So we believe there is a lot more that can be done um, in Berlin and building those alliances going beyond the usual suspects as well. And I believe countries, uh, in terms of like-mindedness, that still also have a very strong support for union membership, that share ownership for the union at large, in particular in this uh, very difficult environment. And I would count, and I'd be interested to hear Ireland uh, as, as part of this list of countries. There is an interest in Berlin um, to really build on that. And... Um, I also believe that Germany in, in many ways uh, has had the experience of being quite a lonely leader and made mistakes uh, over the past years as well, um, would be quite conducive to an environment um, where others were to say, we are also taking ownership, um, again, more for this. Um, we want to engage, we want to invest political capital, we want to invest the resources, um, because I fundamentally believe this is um, the way to keep Germany also interested in the European Union. And this would be the very last point. I believe we should not take for granted the commitment of the political elites in Germany to building the European Union or European consensus forever. And I'm not saying this uh, when I'm looking at the current situation. I feel there is a great sense of ownership and a great Europeanness. But my sense is, um, and I, I'd like to even conduct my own polling about this or surveys amongst the wider public, that Germans are increasingly asking what's in there for us. We are doing so much in our perception. Greece for the refugees, now even in European security and defense, which is very difficult for Germans, and we'll have really controversial debates, I'm sure, about that. Um, we are doing so much, and the others are not really there. How long is this to last? Again, it's not happening at the moment, uh, but I see <coughs> already tendencies of that. Um, partly, of course, driven by um, parties, or one uh, party in particular, the Alternative for Deutschland, but also um, by sort of some wider perception um, in the country. But the case for Europe um, that Angela Merkel at the moment is really uh, bravely and very clearly fighting, and others are as well, is no longer to be made very easily. And if that was a lost battle at some stage, um, then I think European Union politics would be in a completely different uh, environment. Yeah.